Hi, everyone. We're going to examine uh, a passage in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, and how Tertullian used it to eviscerate all of Paul's writings in one blow in a work he wrote in 196 AD, The Prescription Against Heretics. So what's the verse? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, Paul's talking about himself when you read the whole context. And he says he was caught, caught up, in, up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And uh, now... Tertullian wrote a book in 196 AD, and again, he's the leading author of Christianity at the time to defeat anti-law heretics. And he writes there uh, in this book, Prescription Against Heretics, that uh, the heretics must have the true 12 as the origin of their doctrine, or otherwise they have no apostolic authority. And basically in that same book, he says, Paul has no apostolic authority that you can rely upon <clears throat> because he doesn't even have an ability to quote Jesus or Yahweh. Right. Because you go back here when you go to third heaven, you're not allowed to <laughs> repeat anything. And it's inexpressible anyway. You couldn't understand what you were hearing. OK, now just want to show you where the heart and soul of prescription against heretics is coming from is the idea that you can just dump all of Jesus Christ's words, which was the newest mode of way of thinking of the Pauline Christians and the Christians he's dealing with who are heretics. He writes this, All this is the summary of his work. Uh, maybe it's a title that somebody else put there or it's a summary I, or he wrote it. Okay. All Christ's words to the Jews are for us, not indeed as specific commands, but as principles to be applied. So yes, you, you have to look at the law sometimes to understand what applies to us and doesn't. But basically Jesus was saying just it, it, after he had finished uh, and, and was uh, going to ascend, he tells them, teach all the Gentiles, teach all the nations everything I've commanded you. He didn't say there's going to be a whole new set of co different commands that I'm going to give you from heaven through a person who can't quote me and it's illicit for him to speak any of it. But he didn't say any of that. He said, you have everything you need. And that's what Tertullian says. They had everything they needed when he ascended. Now, so my point of this episode is Tertullian uses 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4 to eviscerate all Paul's writings in one blow. And that therefore, you friends who are trying to reach out to your mother, father, brother, sisters, friends, co-workers, so on, and say, hey, look, we need to get back to Jesus. We need to follow his teachings. The church has gotten way, way far away from, the, from Jesus. Every time you go to church, it's 13 quotes of Paul for every one of Jesus. And you could Verify it yourself. Keep a tally mark system and you'll verify to yourself what I'm telling you is true. If you are on the fence here, just do that. Sit there and quote, do a tally mark every time Jesus gets quoted. You'll see it's 13 to 1 for Paul. Now, when you go to the work called on the uh, prescription of heretics, you'll read. This is the heading. St. Peter's further vindication. St. Paul is not superior to St. Peter in teaching. That's a shock, right? This is Tertullian again. This is the orthodox view of Christianity from the time two generations after the apostles have passed on. Uh, 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 Apostle John passed on in 96 AD, so this is about 100 years later. That's about two generations and a half, okay? Nothing imparted to the former, meaning to Paul, in the third heaven enabled him to add to the faith. So Paul has never learned, could not learn, anything that could change the faith of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's a commandment of God to Satan, because I believe this is who is Paul's met in the third heaven. And he thinks it's heaven, but it's not. And and God wouldn't, why would God waste anyone's time bringing him up to heaven and not give him some messages, you know? So he has no messages that he can quote, but, uh, he, but I believe God prohibited Satan in this instance to give Paul anything concrete that he could ever say, Yahweh told me this, or Jesus told me that. Nothing, none of that ever appears in any of Paul's epistles. Heretics boast as if favored with some of the secrets imparted to him. So the heretics at this time are claiming, hey, we've learned mysteries from Paul, but he then says what undermines all of their claims is that they cannot rely upon somebody whose whose words himself he admits are not from Yahweh and are not from Jesus because there was un, he was unable to quote them. <laughs> okay, now um, I just want to read you a couple of things here. This is the full quote. Uh, Let me, let me, uh, well, let's read the whole thing here. I have not the good fortune, or as I must say, I have not had, I have not the unenviable task of setting apostles by the ears. So he's saying, you know, I'm going to, uh, I, I don't have an enviable task that I'm going to correct one of the apostles. And he means Paul here. 
But and inasmuch as our very perverse cavaliers obtrude the rebuke in question for the set purpose of bringing the early doctrine into suspicion, so saying, you're forcing me to make this criticism of a, a quote apostle uh, by calling into question the uh, doctrines, the uh, earlier doctrine of the 12, meaning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, into suspicion. I will put in a defense, as it were, for Peter. So now I'm going to defend Peter because that's the early tradition, and he's going to he's going to defend him against Paul to the effect that even Paul said that he was made all things to all men, to the Jews, the Jew, to those who were not Jews, as one who was not a Jew, that he might gain all. What he means is, in the face, I'm going to defend Paul. Excuse me, I'm going to defend Peter, while at the same time I'm going to point out to you that Paul is a admitted hypocrite. <laughs> He will pretend to be all things to all people. Uh, he'll be a Jew to the Jew. He'll be a Gentile to the Gentile. He doesn't care. He doesn't have any moral center to how he evangelizes. Therefore, it was according to times and persons and causes that they used to censure certain practices which they would not hesitate themselves to pursue. So if you condemn certain practices, uh, there was some people who wouldn't hesitate from actually pursuing them, and that's exactly what Paul does. He would censure people from hypocrisy, but himself would pursue it for the for the glory of God, supposedly, right? And like uh, okay, uh, and like conformity to times and persons causes, just as if Peter too had censured Paul because while forbidding circumcision, he actually circumcised Timothy himself. So you can see that uh, Peter censured Paul for permitting, for, for forbidding circumcision. So of course, circumcision is required to enter the temple, or if you want to go to a, gen, a Jewish person's home at Passover, you must be circumcised. So it's not a, it's not a nothing burger for Gentiles, but it is not uh, demanded unless you get, engage in voluntary actions of entering the temple or going to a J Jewish person's home for Passover. But Paul, claiming that you could forbid circumcision, then goes ahead and has circumcises Timothy, hypocrisy. So this is why he quoted the passage about Paul is all things to all people. He'll say, don't do something, but then he'll exactly do the very thing he for forbid because he's a hypocrite. He's going to pretend to be something he isn't. So right now, right off the bat, you can just see he's censuring Paul. What did he say? What they said, I'm going to set apostles by the ears. He's going to like take Paul's ear and I'm going to pull it, I'm going to yank it. <laughs> He's just done that. He's yanked his ear and shown anybody who has a conscience, you have Christian Pauline Christian, you still must have some little conscience left after all the Pauline preaching you've heard. You must have a little, little trace left of a conscience, conscience for honesty. And you can see he's pointing out Paul is a dishonest person. And he's he's the only thing you can say in, to vindicate Paul is he's very honest about, about his dishonesty. That's all you could. That's the only good redeeming fact about it is he's honest about dishonesty and he does it he believes for good reason you know it's it's good you know i'll circumcise timothy just so people don't complain i'll pretend to be a jew around jews just so that i can win the gospel them over to the gospel i'll pretend to be a gentile i'm completely without any moral restraint even though i do have some i mean so that's that's i mean we know what he's going to rationalize it as but that's not a christian way of behaving that's not what jesus does right just doesn't lie and deceive in order to convince people. Now, continuing, never mind those who pass sentence on apostles. It is a happy fact that Peter is on the same level with Paul and a very glory of margin. So Peter is, in the sense, is he's saying has died as a martyr, as, as supposedly Paul has. And by the way, Paul did not actually die as a martyr, but that's a whole other thing. He actually died naturally, and that was mentioned in the first letter of Clement. That was literally one of the books of the uh, of the Bible for two millennia, and then it just disappears, but reappears in 1627, and there we find it. Paul died a natural death in Spain, and that's why it probably was destroyed from every library conceivable, even though it was part of canon. It was almost guaranteed it was part of canon in every community. It was regarded as a holy writing of God. Regardless, let's go on. Never mind those who pass sentence on apostles. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, now, here's the key. Although Paul was carried away even to the third heaven and was caught up to paradise, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, and heard certain revelations there, yet these cannot possibly seem to have qualified him for teaching another doctrine, seeing that their very nature was such as to render them communicable to no human being. If, however, that unspeakable... Okay, now stop there. So he's, he's telling the... Uh, the heretics, the people who are following Paul, 
you are basing it on a person who is not qualified for teaching another doctrine because he has said, I'm not even allowed to tell you anything that was said in the third heaven. I, I can't quote it. And he doesn't quote Yahweh in talking to him, and he doesn't quote Jesus talking to him, except as I showed you or I mentioned 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul asked to be released from an uh, angel of Satan, and his Jesus allegedly, according to Paul, says, uh, uh, you know what, in your weakness is my strength, and he declines, and he leaves him subject to what Paul called a torment of an angel of Satan. The word angel there is always hidden, so you can't see it. It's translated as messenger, but it's angel if you take a look at Mouncey's transliteral. I will let you do that research on your own. We'll keep going here. So, okay, so he's saying uh, Paul was not quali qualified to teach another doctrine, seeing that the very their very nature was such as to render them communicable to no human being. So they were unspeakably difficult, uncomprehensible, so he couldn't, couldn't even repeat it. And he was also told it's impermissible. So there's no way that the heretics can base anything on Paul's uh, statements because they don't have any inspired characteristic because they, by Paul's own words, they're not from God. Those words you're hearing by Paul's own admission are not truly from God. He may say, I'm speaking the, you know, under the influence of God, but I, I you know, I can't quote him. That's the only bad thing, but that's not how inspiration works. <laughs> Paul has to actually quote Yahweh or God. Yahweh has to speak over his head. Like Jesus, he spoke over Jesus, this, you know, listen to him. And, and Jesus was confirmed thereby as the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, meaning someone whose every word would be from the Father, because we now know the Father was dwelling in Jesus, and the Logos you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So that's why Jesus is 100% inspired, while Paul is 0%, because he doesn't have this same uh, uh, affirmation from God over, over and above him, just like happened to Moses, by the way, and Jesus, but did not happen to Paul. It wasn't that everything Paul would say would be from God. Instead, Jesus in the three, the alleged Jesus in uh, Acts 9, 22 and 26 were same story about the Damascus Road thing. His Jesus says to him, you will be a martis, meaning you'll be a witness. OK, and not that's not the same thing as a prophet or an apostle. OK. Now, this is an interesting argument that I had never heard of before, so I want you to see the next sentence. Do you see where it says here? I'm going to put my cursor. If, however... That unspeakable mystery did leak out and became known to any man. And if any heresy affirms that it does itself follow the same, then either Paul must be charged with having betrayed the secret <laughs> or some other man must actually be shown to have been afterwards caught up into paradise who had permission to speak out plainly what Paul was not allowed even to mutter. Now, I think this is very effective by Tertullian. He's saying, look, hey, if you claim, and this is what they were claiming, we understand Paul's message. If you, for example, tell me what Romans 7 means or Romans 14 means, I'm going to tell you, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't quote any of this as if it's from the word of God because Paul tells you it's not. It's just himself talking. And why are you taking it as if it's the word of God? And it's it's apostasy. No, you know, way overboard apostasy. Romans 7, the the the. the the one who uh, the, the husband dies and when the husband dies, the law between him and his wife go away. And therefore, you the wife is free to marry another person. I mean, this is all heresy. This is apostasy. The law is gone. Jesus said the law would go away until the heavens and earth go away. So what kind of nonsense is this? And God 21 times says the law is eternal for all generations. And Paul is saying it's gone in his day when Jesus died. The, the father dwelling in him died. And therefore, when Jesus resurrected, the father remained dead. I mean. How can you not see the, the apostasy in this? And yet you want to claim this is from God, yet Paul says, I'm not even allowed to quote God. I'm not allowed to express anything. It was inexpressible and so on. So it's a very effective point. And if he did say, if he, if he even said this is from God, you would have to conclude he betrayed the secret. He was told this is something you can't tell anybody. Why are you doing this? It's prohibited. It's illicit. So he'd be violating. What, so he'd be what? He'd be breaking God's law to tell you something he's not allowed to say. So it didn't, but it didn't happen. We don't have that in any of the epistles. Or the other alternative is somebody else claimed they went up to third heaven, got all this secret information, 
and somehow they had a better privilege than Paul did. Well, the answer to that is didn't happen either. There's no claim of that anywhere in history. So anyway, this is a hopefully a helpful argument to some of you. I didn't see this full quote until just today. So I wanted to share it with you and let you absorb it and then study it yourself. It's in, uh, you see here, I marked it as chapter 24. See up here on the, in the circle, chapter 24, Prescription Against Heretics. It's a short book, but it's very powerful and has a very, very, uh, a passage that is just saying the obvious. Paul never quotes Yahweh, never quotes Jesus. Why the heck are we taking him for ser anything serious? Okay, God bless. Take care, everyone. Ciao, bye.